My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Gretchen Fitzgerald and John Davis. Think back to 2015. Justin Trudeau and the Liberals had just ended nine years of conservative rule. Though many people committed to working for social and environmental justice were skeptical from the beginning of how much this new government would actually change things, there was still a sense of widespread relief at the change in the landscape in which grassroots movements would be continuing to push for change. Since that time, there have been no shortage of examples where the promised sunny ways of the Liberal government have proven to be more gloss than substance environmental issues prominently among them. Perhaps most visible in this area has been the federal approval of tar sands pipelines, with the accompanying bizarre justification that building new infrastructure that will contribute to climate change is somehow an integral part of fighting climate change. However, that is far from the only example. The Liberals have also been hard at work figuring out how to revamp the environmental assessment system that was gutted by the previous government and recently released a massive draft bill containing their proposed changes, which has been met with mixed reviews from people engaged in struggles related to the environment. This episode of Talking Radical Radio deals with one specific area where not only does this new legislation fail to reverse damage done by the previous government, it in fact makes it worse. Since the mid-1980s, the Canada-Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and the Canada-Newfoundland and Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board have existed as joint federal-provincial agencies. They are largely staffed with people who have some connection to fossil fuel industries, and their mandate from the governments that created them is to promote oil and gas development on the East Coast. They already play a role in shaping where certain kinds of potentially dangerous fossil fuel exploration activities occur, things like seismic blasting, which can have a major impact on ecosystems. Today's guests argue that this role should be decreased to reduce the power of industry and strengthen the role of environmental protection principles in deciding where and when these activities can occur. The new legislation, however, does exactly the opposite, and expands the power of the petroleum boards to include a major role not just in shaping exploratory activities, but in the environmental assessment process itself for all offshore fossil fuel projects, including drilling and production. This has energized an uncommon instance of coalition between environmental groups, community groups, and a wide cross-section of organizations based in the East Coast fishery, this coalition is calling itself the Offshore Alliance. Gretchen Fitzgerald is the National Program Director for the Sierra Club Canada Foundation. John Davis is the Director of the Clean Ocean Action Committee, a consortium of fisheries groups, vessel owners, captains, crew members, plant operators, and workers, altogether representing about 9,000 people dependent on fishing in the waters around Nova Scotia. They argue that it would be inappropriate for the agencies whose mandate is to promote fossil fuel extraction to play such a significant role in the environmental assessment of exactly the kinds of projects that they are mandated to promote. They argue that this puts ecosystems at risk, and it puts the livelihoods of people who depend on healthy fisheries at risk as well. And they argue that it is contrary to many of the things promised by the Liberals in 2015, and that it demonstrates the ongoing power wielded by the fossil fuel industry in Ottawa to the detriment of the environment and other sectors of the economy. Gretchen and John talk about the threat that this poses to marine ecosystems and to the well-being of many Nova Scotia communities that depend on the fishery, and they talk about the work of the Offshore Alliance to try and stop it. My name is Gretchen Fitzgerald, and I'm the National Program Director for Sierra Club Canada Foundation. And we're proud members of the Offshore Alliance, which was formed to protect the oceans, particularly off Nova Scotia, but I think also off Atlantic Canada in general, from offshore oil and gas development and its impacts on our environment. Sierra Club is actually one of the oldest 
environmental organizations in North America. It has a mandate to protect, explore, and enjoy nature. We function a little bit differently than a lot of national organizations because we have a grassroots mandate. So what we're going to work on and how we strategize is very much determined by local members and concerned individuals in communities and chapters across the country. And Sierra Club has been involved in trying to improve our record for protecting our oceans and preventing oil and gas development, particularly in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, for almost 20 years now. My name is John Davis. I am the director of the Clean Ocean Action Committee, which is a consortium of fisheries groups, vessel owners, captains, crew members, fish plant owners and operators and workers. We represent the Lobster Fishermen's Association in Area 33 off the Nova Scotia coast, the Lobster Fishermen's Association off Area 34, the Shelburne County Groundfish Quota Group, the Scotia Fundy Inshore Fishermen's Association, the Nova Scotia Fish Packers Association, which represents about 50 inshore fish plants, their owners, operators, and workers, the Cold Water Lobster Association, the Maritime Fishermen's Union, Local 9, Local 6, and Local 4. We represent about 9,000 people who are directly involved and dependent on the renewable resources on the Scotian Shelf and on Canada's East Coast. We have here in Atlantic Canada the richest multi-species fishing grounds in all of North America. We have depended on these resources for three centuries in our European communities and for thousands of years for our Mi'kmaq communities, and we are demanding that we get the appropriate protections from the oil and gas industry as hydrocarbons are developed here on the East Coast. And to date, we have no such assurances, and we're immensely concerned. How did the Offshore Alliance initially come together? The Offshore Alliance (laughs) came together because it was impossible not to come together. All of the players don't always work together. You don't always get fisheries groups working with other environmental NGOs, but we simply had no choice. The force that drove us together really was the fact that the federal government, with the assistance of the province of Nova Scotia and the province of Newfoundland, is looking to make changes to the environmental assessment process. Now, these are the kinds of things that the federal government guaranteed that they would do in the 2015 election. Unfortunately, part of what they are doing is really massively retrograde. They said that they would try to undo the damage that the Harper government had created to our regulatory systems. But one of the things, the thing that drove us together and literally made it impossible for us not to work together is the fact that the federal government is in the process of putting the Nova Scotia Offshore Petroleum Board and the Newfoundland and Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board in charge of environmental impact assessment. These two organizations have a mandate to promote hydrocarbon development on the east coast of Canada. There is no way that they can meld that mandate with a mandate to oversee environmental protections. We feel it is absolutely essential that we do everything in our power to stop that process and to create an independent assessment office or committee that can actually look at environmental impacts in a sane fashion. Yeah, as John said, it was a force that we couldn't resist just because it was just such a stark reversal of where we're supposed to be going. The federal government got in on a ticket that was promising better environmental protection, better adherence to climate goals, improved consultation with Canadians, respect for Indigenous rights, and a lot of the things that they are doing by giving these offshore boards, which do have a mandate to promote oil and gas, their membership is made up in large part by people with backgrounds in oil and gas industry, either working in the industry or promoting the industry. Um, These are the wrong people to be deciding on where oil and gas goes, whether that's seismic blasting, exploratory drilling, any of the activities involved. 
And definitely not the people to be determining what activities are just too much for other species to endure or other industries to endure. And that's, I think, why there's so many fishing groups involved is they can see and really feel that they are being threatened and they're not being given an equal voice in the decision making here. It does seem to be just a step backward and, and we really felt we needed to make a strong case to hopefully reverse this. It's really important, Scott, that we get your listeners to think back to 2015 and to remember some of the liberal platform promises that they made. They started with the statement, we will make environmental assessments credible again. Well, this process of putting the petroleum boards in any way in charge of environmental assessments is 180 degrees out of phase with that statement. But they went on to say that resource-based projects can create jobs, but success depends upon regaining public trust. Well, I can assure you, they're not regaining any public trust in this process. They go on to say that Canadians must be able to trust that government will engage in appropriate regulatory oversight, including credible environmental assessments, and that it will respect the rights of those most affected, such as Indigenous communities and my communities, not indigenous, but my coastal communities should easily fit into that process. They said, and I quote, while governments grant permits for resource development, only communities can grant permission. Well, I'm telling you, Scott, we do not grant permission for the petroleum boards to be arbiters of environmental impact assessment, period. We don't do it. So they say they're going to restore robust oversight and thorough environmental assessments of areas under federal jurisdiction. Not happening. This is completely the opposite kind of move that they could make in terms of that statement. And they go on and on and on. But there's one more that I want to read to you. And it states, we will end the practice of having federal ministers interfere in the environmental assessment process. And Scott, this is federal ministers. You have Minister McKenna, Minister LeBlanc, and Minister Carr, and they are interfering in a vastly negative way. They are abdicating their responsibilities to the Canadian resource base, to the Canadian people who are dependent on that base, to the health and welfare of our oceans. They are abdicating that responsibility and handing it over to unelected boards that are made up of past oil industry executives. That's who sits on these boards. It is simply untenable. This makes no sense at all, and it shouldn't occur. You mentioned the importance of thinking back to 2015. So let's do that. To give listeners some context, talk about what kinds of damage that the Harper Conservative government did to environmental regulations and what people were hoping for from the Liberals back then. Yeah, you know, in some ways, hard to go back to those times because definitely the environmental community felt under attack. And in some ways, there did seem to be some deliberate moves to silence us, either through audits or other means. But yeah, definitely some of the changes that came in under the conservative Harper government were meant, I think, deliberately to limit the ability of Canadians to be involved in an assessment planning process. And I think the new bill actually reverses that. So that's actually a good thing. And then one of the things that was done was limiting the number of things that got assessed and then what kind of impacts actually counted anymore. And a lot of this was done by either taking stuff off the list that was no longer assessed or by diminishing protections of fish habitat and rivers and streams and parts of our oceans across the country. So kind of diminishing actually what counted in terms of an environmental impact in these assessments. I think all of these things were very damaging, both to the environment, but to the credibility of the process. And so, yes, we do see some good things, or at least Sierra Club does, in the draft bill that came out. But the problem is, for the East Coast, these offshore boards can determine activities in over 80% of the water out here. They give permission and authorize activities like seismic blasting, which Dr. Lindy Walgar, who presented at our press conference, described as one of the loudest human-produced noises right after nuclear and chemical explosions. 
it's a very, very damaging activity for marine life. And people don't understand the extent to which it has taken place on the East Coast here. If we're going to allow these offshore boards to allow an activity like seismic and be able to assess where that's going to happen and whether it's okay for right whales and other creatures that are really some of their resistance is hanging by a thread is inappropriate. So, yeah, going back to what we had in Jurge, sure, it's great to see some positive attention and some of the decision making and some of the things restored. But what makes this move to give more power to the offshore boards, it it makes it kind of incredible to us that this would be allowed is in that context of a government that was trying to fix these wrongs. I mean, this goes farther than what the conservatives did. And it does make me very, very concerned that we are going to suffer impacts and we are going to see extinctions. We are going to see things happen that our federal government is supposed to protect us from happening. Even though those were dark days for environmental protection in Canada, This piece of the change that they're proposing is, I think, of the same flavor. It shows the influence of the oil and gas industry in Ottawa. And there are thousands of people here who want a different way of managing our oceans. And it just really flies in the face of what's really needed here to protect the oceans. John went into considerable detail talking about a number of specific measures taken by the Conservative government that have not been reversed by the Liberals, including allowing oil companies to proceed when they have inadequate capacity to clean up spills, including permitting the use of chemical dispersants that would essentially deal with spills by diluting the toxins in the ocean and thereby putting the fishery at risk, and including allowing exploration and drilling activities in areas that the many organizations he represents consider to be putting the fishery and their livelihoods at risk. What powers and what role do the petroleum boards currently have? The petroleum boards, since 1984-85, they're imbued with the power to lease the ocean sites to oversee impactful activities such as seismic work, as Gretchen's already indicated. They are immensely influential already in the environmental impact assessment process because they are used as quote-unquote technical advisors. Their responsibility is to promote the development of offshore oil and gas resources on the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia waters. The initial environmental assessments that the oil companies purportedly have to do before they get their lease sites, all of that initial work is paid for by the taxpayers. The Petroleum Board does that for them. That kind of relationship makes it absolutely impossible for them to be functional adjudicators of environmental impacts. They can't do it. They are part of the process. They are enablers of the oil and gas industry. That's their mandated role. They don't have the mandate, nor do they have really the capacity to evaluate or even do correct consultation. We've questioned all along their ability to protect the environment. And currently, they have a say over where seismic goes. They definitely have a say where oil and gas goes at all in general on the East Coast, which, again, I think should be an ecosystem and environmental decision, not just taken from an oil point of view. When it comes to other activities like exploratory drilling, which is the drilling that oil companies do to figure out if their seismic blasting and other tests and other science is actually correct and is there a viable and exploitable resource down there, they do that before they go to what's called production drilling, which is when they're actually pumping oil or gas to be sold. So exploratory drilling currently now and production drilling would go to the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency for assessment and approval with the boards already, as John pointed out, advising, but not having decision-making powers or not being involved in the decision-making. So the difference here now under the new bill, potentially, and much does depend on what gets put on the list, for what gets assessed is for certain activities, there will be a panel struck and it will only probably be for certain activities. So potentially just production drilling, for instance, would go to a panel. But that panel now (laughs) under the draft act will have sitting on it and determining if something's going to go ahead, at least two members from the offshore oil boards. 
that's giving them a lot more say than what they currently have in terms of whether exploratory or production drilling would go ahead. And if everything below production drilling, say, for instance, just exploratory drilling or seismic blasting is handed to the boards to evaluate, in terms of exploratory drilling, it's giving them a step further say in what gets evaluated and how it gets evaluated for the offshore. In your experience at in-person events or via the media, what kinds of things have ordinary Nova Scotians who are not involved in the fishing industry and are not members of environmental groups been saying about it? The people that I speak with, number one, unfortunately, are not well informed. So it takes a while to kind of bring people up to speed. But in every instance, the people that I've spoken with have understood the issues that we're bringing forward have been both amazed and distressed by the fact that it's this liberal government that is bringing forth this legislation written in this fashion. So I would say that we're starting to get the word out. We're starting to have you know the regular Canadian citizen begin to understand this issue. And as I said, once the issue is understood, people are supportive of the role that the Offshore Alliance is taking. Yeah, I would echo that. It's a complex issue because it involves laws that are being amended. There's an almost 400-page document that got, you know, slammed on somebody's desk in the House of Commons. It's not something you're going to read for fun. So it's a complex issue. It often happens in, you know, some of this oil development is happening in places that people don't see unless you are in the fishing industry. So to some people, it might seem very complicated and very distant, but I think the fate of the right whale and the death of the right whales this summer in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, I hope to some degree, has raised an alarm for all Canadians about the state of our oceans and what we're doing out here and how we need to take care and have to do better. And I would agree with John, almost everyone I speak with, unless they are, of course, from the oil industry itself, they agree. You can't have a valid assessment process for projects of this magnitude with this level of risk, handing that over to boards that, you know, it's basically in their mandate to promote industry and its expansion on the East Coast. What has the Offshore Alliance been doing to draw attention to these proposed changes and to push back against them? We just completed on the 24th of January a press conference and demonstration based in Halifax and we made all of these views known. We made everything from the Vancouver Sun to the St. John's Telegram. So we tried to get our views out there and we tried to educate the people of Canada to understand what's going on here in terms of the actual actions that this federal government is taking versus what we all voted on in 2015. Canadians care about the environment. Canadians care about our forests, they care about our oceans, they care about our lakes and rivers. Well, they have to know what's happening now on the East Coast in terms of our Canadian oceans and in the Arctic, quite frankly, because the kinds of changes that are taking place are not in any way protecting those resources. So we want people to know what's actually happening. And we'd like them to express their concerns to their MPs, whether they're from Saskatchewan or BC or one of the territories. We want people to understand and to take some action. The Offshore Alliance continues to meet, mainly by conference call. We delivered a letter to Scott Bryson's office in Halifax for him to deliver to the prime minister. And we await a response from the prime minister to the concerns that we've raised. We obviously don't have that response yet, but we will be in the not distant future reminding the prime minister that he has received that letter and continuing to demand a response from him and an explanation of why these kinds of actions could be taken based upon the promises that he made in 2015. And I guess we just continually have to educate, and John has done an incredible job presenting, holding public events, going to municipalities, talking to leaders, talking to communities about what this actually means. You know, what would it mean to have a spill in our offshore, which we are unprepared to deal with, in an area where no drilling should have occurred in the first place? 
this could have severe consequences for our fisheries and for our oceans and for endangered species like the right whale. We are planning to do everything we can to present to committees that will be evaluating this bill because after it gets read in the House a couple times, the bill then goes to committees and we're not sure how many committees it will go to because it is such a far-reaching bill having to do with the environment, energy, natural resources. It could be more than one committee, but trying to get as many experts and folks there to present and to speak up and asking as many people as possible to call into question this step in particular that was part of the proposed new legislation for environmental assessment in Canada or impact assessment in Canada, as it's been called now. So still a lot of education. I guess we're inviting more allies to join us. The alliance is not closed. So yes, we would invite others to join if you are concerned and want to be part of the alliance. Uh, Your organization does, then please uh, get in touch. But yeah, definitely we're trying to get the word out about what this could mean and that it really, really needs to be rethought in a sensible way. A closing point might be, Scott, that if Canada is going to meet its commitments to the Paris Accord, if Canada is going to actually attain the carbon footprint that our prime minister has prescribed for us, then we cannot fully utilize the hydrocarbon resources that we've already identified. We have to find other ways. So a basic question for all Canadians is, what are we doing? What is this exploration process going to avail for us? What can come of it that's going to be really helpful other than a few royalty checks to the provinces? We're at a watershed moment for our planet. Our oceans can be the canary in the mine shaft to a certain degree. And we need to stop and rethink, not just on these specific levels, but on the general level of how we want Canada to perform and how we want Canada to respond to the issues of global warming and to the requirement to develop alternative energy sources. So there's a big framework to fit the issues that Gretchen and I are talking about into. And I would hope that any Canadians listening would think about it in that wider context, too. You have been listening to my interview with Gretchen Fitzgerald and John Davis about the Offshore Alliance, a coalition of environmental groups, community groups, and organizations based in the fishing industry in Nova Scotia. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to talkingradical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week.